then, I am planning to start strictly on time because I have 70 minutes of material and 50 minutes in which to <laughs> convey it to you. Um, so, my name's Daniel Thompson. I am currently the uh, ST Microelectronics assignee on the Kernel Working Group. Um, I have a long history of speaking too fast to be understood. So, my man Christian Levo is going to wave at me whenever I start, start <laughs> speaking too fast and get overexcited. <laughs> but other people are welcome to do that as well. Um, so basically this, this talk is going to describe, um, we're going to look at the NMI as it exists on x86 PC style hardware and compare it to FIC on the R. We'll also explain what FIC is for anybody who's, who's rusty on that. Um, and then we'll look at how we can use that NMI to use the kernel diagnostic and debugging features. Um, I then have to bore you with some practical difficulties of deploying this because however cool this stuff is, it won't deploy on all devices, and particularly V7 devices, it can be quite fussy about where you can and can't use the, the work. Um, and there is a live demo, um, which I've got sitting here. And there is a bonus extra if there is time. Um, don't hold out too much hope for that, for <laughs> all the reasons I just said about the amount of material. So NMI on x86. Um, it has a very long history as a debug tool. Um, and even the kind of very first PCs that IBM produced um, had things like memory parity errors hooked up to the NMI. So if your hardware started to fail, NMI was what told you it had gone wrong. Um, and that carries right through to the modern era, where um, rack mount servers, I'm told, <coughs> never seen one, quite often have a physical NMI button on the front panel so that if it is acting up, misbehaving, not doing what it should, you stab that button and you hope that your operating system has some kind of handler to either squirt out diagnostics on the um, UART or to uh, uh, do a K-jump or whatever else, but, but the bu buttons are there to, to, to help you diagnose it. Um, watchdogs, if they're present on PCs, are, are frequently hooked up to FIC, uh, sorry, to, to NMI, so that you can go above the level of normal software to try and get messages out about what's gone wrong with the system. Uh, and finally, the performance counters that you find in, in an x86 system are hooked directly into the local APIC. The local APIC is the part of the intro control on a PC that is bound to a CPU core. Um, and so the performance counters are, are unique per core, uh, and they're hooked directly into the local APIC, which gives you the capacity to route those performance counter uh, interrupts to NMI, and the reasons for that we'll, we'll again get onto later. Um, I was actually a little bit surprised when I read the spec for the APIC and realised how flexible it is. You know, you can just grab random intuits and route them to and from NMI. And you think, well, why doesn't the x86 use NMI for more stuff? Um, and the answer to that is in interrupt sharing. Um, you don't want to put all your interrupts into NMI, otherwise that rather defeats the point. Um, and on systems where you have uh, extensive use of interrupt sharing, you, you simply can't take those lines and, and turn them into NMIs, because if you do that, you take all the other peripherals with you. I even sat down on my home computer um, and played with its UARTs, and if you run two of the UARTs simultaneously, they both bind to the same interrupt, and I, I, you couldn't realistically take one to NMI and, and not the other. And because of the flexibility <coughs> of the platform, the, the way it's constructed, it's difficult to exploit NMI for things it wasn't designed to do. So all the stuff that it's designed to do is all working great, but there's not much scope to experiment, I, I, in, certainly in classic PC architecture. Um, FIC on ARM is a completely different heritage. Um, I like to characterize it as a 30-year-old trick so that Acorn didn't have to put a DMA chip into the Archimedes. Um, and actually, it is 30 years old. Uh, ARM turns 30 in April, I believe. So that's the anniversary of the, FIC, the, the ARM 1 coming out of the fab. So it genuinely is 30 years old. 28 years old if you take the fact that it says here we get five extra banked registers. And one of the characteristics of FIC is it's designed so it can handle um, requests from hardware very, very quickly. And it has hardware banked registers to reduce the cost of context switching into and out of FIC mode. Um, and the change they made 20 <coughs> years ago was to boost the number of banked registers so they could meet their performance targets. Um, 
we'll look at how that pans out in a minute. But um, this feature, th this capacity to take interrupts really quickly, is still relevant in the kind of modern era. Um, it's not used by many socks because you can't decide. No, no hardware designer alive is going to say that's the most important peripheral. You must put that one up to fix because hard designers say, oh, there's soft systems integration or software will decide it. The software guys say, well, how are we supposed to decide who should do it? In the end, no one uses it. Um, but circumstances where it does get used a lot tend to come up in FPGA-based designs. Um, because if you have long latencies in interrupt of comms from FPGA, you have to burn gates on your FPGA to store the data. So FPGA guys really love fast interrupts because they can then use that to, to bring down the gate count on the actual part of the FPGA. Um, and a final note on, on FIC, um, I'm going to start from this point forward using the phrase FIC and NMI more or less interchangeably because I'm trying to bring all this stuff to R. Um, but in practice FIC is not truly non-maskable. There is, there is a bit that you can raise in the ARMS PSR that will cause it to be masked. But the reality of the situation is it is never really masked by, by Linux. Uh, it is masked by the big little switcher, um, and it is masked by code to install FIC handlers to try and stop the FIC firing while you're installing a handler for it. Um, but other than that, the Linux kernel doesn't touch the F bit at all, and FIC can be enabled through for the life of the entire rest of the kernel. This is an artist's diagram of an arm. Um, it is not designed to reflect reality. Um, for a start, I've made the controller three times as big as the course, which is perhaps a, <laughs> a slight exaggeration. But it's just showing you the, the rough flow of places in the chip where you can mask interrupts. Um, so, so I have planned to jump around at this point, but then the microphones wouldn't pick me up. Um, so actually, I'm going to have to, because my point is not working. So interrupts are coming in at the top of the system, and you've got the enables in the, the git right at the entrance point where you can um, enable them or disable them. When you call enable IRQ, disable IRQ, these are the um, gates that get moved. Um, and after that, there's routing logic. So uh, interrupt affinity allows you to steer interrupts to the different cores. Um, and you can also, at that point, say what group you would like your interrupt to belong to. Uh, group 1 means go to the I bit, the classic interrupt point. Group 0 means come down to the F bit and you're a fig. So that's what these, these lines are. These are lines you can adjust where they go to that allow you to um, control where the interrupt is going to arrive. Then you have priority filter. Um, we will come back to the priority filter uh, towards the end of the talk. It's very important. Um, its job occurs in real-time operating systems where you have multiple sources of interrupt and you want to continue to take interrupts of higher priority <coughs> while you are running. Um, Linux doesn't exploit that in any meaningful sense. It runs all the interrupts at a fixed priority like a PC would. Um, once you've left the interrupt controller, you're down at the ARM core where the PSR has two little bits, I and F, processor status register for anybody who's not deeply familiar with ARM. Um, two bits, I and F, that can be used to mask or unmask the interrupt. And this is just a final visualization of the register system. Um, once I've said you can do all these cool fast things with the fast interrupt, um, lots of people asked what they were. Um, so this is just a, it's a register diagram. It's very similar to the ones you see in, in books on ARM architecture. Um, on the side here, these are the registers as you would normally hit them in user mode. So when you say, I want to read register 8, if you're in user mode, you can get register 8. Um, these two special registers, the link register and the stack register, are banked many, many times over for each different source of exception. So when you take an IRQ, the hardware will automatically bank two registers, and the reason it does that is because that's all it needs to store state. Um, the link register is used to store the program <coughs> counter at the point that exception was taken, so you know where to jump back to when you leave your exception. And the stack pointer allows you to switch stacks automatically when you take an exception so that you don't have to worry about the protection on your <coughs> stack. You know you've got a good stack to store your context on. Uh, so all the exception modes take these and switch these registers over. So 
that if you're running in IRQ mode, for example, um, then at the point the exception is taken and you try to read R13, you don't hit this register like you would in user mode, you hit this register. And the, the trick in FIC to allow it to do these stackless DMA-like operations is that you get these five extra registers. And of course, you're running stackless, so you've also got a spare stack register. So you have six registers that you can use to keep your register pointer, your write pointer, your base address, your counter of where you're actually going to do your DMA to. And, and that's just about enough to write a, a very basic FIFO type DMA assembler stuff. And I've told you all these cool things about FIC, and now I'm going to say that I don't care about any of them. That was all background so you can understand where it come from. Um, I really want to think about the fact that it's non-maskable. Uh, all the work that I've done is, is solely concentrating on its non-maskableness. Um, but there is still some history in Linux, and as I say, there are still users of FIC in its classic sense. So historically, all the software that exists in the kernel right now um, tends to be geared up to using it for its historical purpose. And that's supported by a, a very simple API. You can enable, disable, you can reserve this resource because only one driver can use FIC at once. If you've customized all your registers, you can't share handlers, you can't demux, you can't do anything like that. Uh, but you can reserve and release. There are also some calls to populate the banked registers for you because you do need to pre-fill them if you want to consume them. Um, and to mem copy your handler into the vector table. FIC has one tiny cool trick up its sleeve, which is that FIC has been carefully placed as the last entry in the vector table. What that means is you don't have to do a jump when you land in the vector table. You can go straight line through your code to do whatever it is you have to do. So it just saves a jump at the beginning of the handler. Um, and as I say, for this talk, however cool that feature is, the only aspect of it that, that I care about is the, the, the fact that it's never masked. Uh, and to that end, I, I spent some time, as did Anton before me, uh, who, who did some of this work in 2012. Um, we have the new default FIC handler for ARM. This is upstream right now. Um, it's not easy to reach, but it's upstream. Um, and the way it works is it, it makes FIC just like any other exception. Um, it will try to save a little bit of register state. It will then switch to supervisor mode, which is where the kernel keeps all its stacks as it's taking exceptions. Um, it will complete the context switch by dumping most of the registers onto the supervisor stack, and then it hops into a C function. Um, and from there on, you're running the, all the rest of the C code that you would usually use to handle exceptions. Um, and this is intended to give us the primary handler for NMI-like use cases. Um, it's not appropriate for software DMA because I've just done you know, uh, 16 memory writes, probably more than that actually for the other status registers. Um, but it's, it's almost too easy to use, right? It's, it's jumped into C, that's terrific, how hard can it be? Um, there are a number of gotchas to working with NMI um, and it's even worse than that, that even after I've explained the gotchas to you, you'll still think, yeah, how hard can it be? But I'm gonna do my best to convince you. Um, the, the most fundamental thing is that locks are, I'm going to say always, there is actually a couple of cases where it's not, but always unsafe from NMI. Um, and the reason for that is any lock that is contended in an NMI and a non-NMI case means that if you take the NMI at a bad time, uh, you will lock, you will hang. Um, and that, that means you essentially can't use locking anywhere in your NMI uh, system. Uh, so everything you have to do must be lockless. Now, I, I could get a raise of hands to say who's ever used an interrupt lock or seen an interrupt lock inside the kernel, but I'm expecting to see every hand to go up if I ask that. You know, locks are everywhere inside the kernel. Um, but just to give you a quick summary, you can't print. You can't write to the console. If you write to the console, not only are there spin locks inside the print K code, but a lot of the ARM console handlers also have spin locks inside the sender character <coughs> to UART called. Um, so you can't print. Um, you can't wake up a thread, um, because to wake up a thread, you have to manipulate the scheduler data structures, which the scheduler might be trying to read while you're doing this. Um, you can't queue tasslets for exactly the same reason, that the thing that's going to schedule a tasslet is not able to cope with you changing its data structures underneath it. Um, 
So this gives us a slight problem, which is how do you actually cause work to be delegated from FIC to the rest of the system? It actually makes it quite hard for the FIC to even communicate with the rest of the world. And there's a bit of a tip, which is there is this function called IRQQ work, which um, can be used to defer work out of the um, NMI and into a normal interrupt handler, where for the normal interrupt handler, you, you can use locks and other things to get the message down to the scheduler or down to task or wherever else. Um, IRQ work is a funny API um, because it is architecturally defined when the work gets done. Uh, there's a lovely little comment in the source code that says, on a lame architecture, this will be done from the time of tick interrupt. Um, and the theory is that on architectures that are not lame, uh, you can get it done more quickly. So ARM is, in this case, both lame and not lame. Um, if it's an SMP system, uh, IRQ Q work raises an IPI and we act on it immediately. If you're not on an SMP system, um, it does get delegated to the time tick. So we're happy with the gotchas. Have I convinced you it's really hard? Because <laughs> uh, at this point, I'm now going to introduce a couple of my favorite war stories from while I was doing this work, uh, which I'm calling Gremlins. Um, this code that you see before you, seven opcodes, it's not very much, is it? Um, has an NMI bug concealed in it. I welcome you all to start reading it now to try and guess where it might be. Um, let me tell you what it is, though. Um, if you've seen my patch, you're not allowed to play, by the way, if you've read the patch previously. Um, this is the code to restore the user re registers. Um, it's used from an IRQ state to return to a user state um, or an SVC state. Actually. So, so system calls or interrupts, it's used to get out of system calls and interrupts and back into regular user mode. Um, and I had a problem, which is whenever I did a while one loop in Bash, and generated NMIs, uh, eventually Bash would segfault. And after a surprising amount of work, I discovered its register state was corrupt. And after even more work, which involved getting the FIC handler to describe the state of the system when I um, had found a failure, so I had the segv handler stopping the system dead so that I could play with it, and I had the FIC handler storing the points it had previously interrupted. And it said, there, every time, well not every time, uh, almost every time it was this opcode. So that should give you a clue. Um, it wasn't always that opcode, because if you had two fix, I'd actually moved on to a different part of the kernel. I was usually in the um, page fault handler, um, just random parts of the page fault handler. But this was the really hot opcode. Um, has anybody got it? It's, it's, if you're an operating system guy, you'll curse yourself for not getting it. Um, <coughs> this shriek here is a thing that causes the stack pointer to be written back to. What happens, it's part of the indirect addressing mechanism. When you're doing an indirect address, you generate an address from the, the maths in this section here. Um, and the shriek causes the result to be written back to the offset register. So in other words, that there deallocates the stack. And that there copies data off the stack and puts it back on the register set. If you're interrupted here, then the FIC handle will come in and store all the context on the stack that you just deallocated. It took me a very, very, very long time to find that. Um, but yes, ultimately, it, it's, 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 you, you see it in the embedded operating systems and priority systems. If, if you start deallocating the stack before you have removed all the data off it, eventually you will find that that stack gets corrupt. Um, and that's what happened. Uh, it, it took you know tens of thousands of fix for that to happen, but eventually it happened to me. Um, so that's a gremlin that nobody else is ever going to see. It caused me several days of pain, but nobody else is ever going to see it. Um, this one is one that many people may see if they start playing with the work that I've been doing. So this is a much more important one. The other one's a fun war story. This one's an important warning. Um, this piece of code. Um, is the code for a freescale system so that you can put out a character on the serial port from KDB. Uh, and I wanted to run that code from NMI. And when I run it, it, it hangs arbitrarily. Um, has anybody here got any ideas of why that might be? <coughs> Who 
hey, nobody, that's really cool. <laughs> I thought somebody would have, have this somewhere in, in the room. Um, <clears throat> Vital. What does Vital do? Vital allows you to write to memory mapped I.O. It then has a memory barrier. It then calls into the L2 cache and tries to make sure the line is properly maintained. And to make sure it doesn't mess up the cache state, it takes a spin lock. <laughs> and I was fibergasted as well. I couldn't believe that Vital, of all things, had a spin lock lurking inside it. It was, it was a real shock. Um, but yeah, yeah on, on systems with L2 caches, um, if you call Vital from an NMI handler, you are at risk of deadlock. It is as simple as that. Um, there are workarounds for systems that don't do DMA, which is to use Vital Relaxed. Vital Relaxed is a relaxed version of Vital that guarantees memory order to the peripheral. So all the writes you use for peripheral will be right, the order preserved. Question. You say L2 caches. Do you mean non-architectural L2 caches? Oh, it's the outer sync logic. I have to admit, yeah. I didn't deep. It, it, there's hooks in the cache, in the yeah. logic to do outer sync um, stuff. Yeah, and so certainly it's, it's, on an, it's an out of core um, L2 cache. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you'll still have compiled that into a, a multi-platform kernel. Well, it's function pointed in, so so the, the sync logic that yeah. takes this um, spin lock sits through a function pointer, which may or may not be set depending on what you're running on. Um, but the general case is that if you're writing portable code, if you don't know you've got, if you, if you don't know what type of cache you've got, you can't can't be sure. Um, so yes, you've got Readle and Vital relaxed which guarantee ordering to the peripheral, but not with respect to memory. And that what Vital is trying to do with the cache management and the, the memory barriers is to preserve the sequential order between writes to the peripheral and writes by other places. And the reason it does that is if you've got a DMA unit, somebody else does care about the ordering of memory. When you tell your DMA unit to go and read the descriptor, um, if you haven't got it out of the memory system yet, you are in trouble. Um, but, so if, if you're going to drive hardware from, a FIC, from an NMI, um, you have to be using relaxed accessors, and that is quite a strong limitation because there's certain types of hardware you just can't run like that. Um, serial ports, generally speaking, you can switch to relaxed if you've checked out that they're not using DMA in the mode you're running them in. Uh, sometimes it involves disabling the DMA mode, but for serial ports and things like that, you, you can generally switch to relaxed. Um, I now have a change of colour. A dramatic change of colour. This is uh, I've gone to black every time I'm lurching in a different direction in the talk. Um, so this is a big change of direction now. Um, we've talked now about what FIC is. We've done a few fun war stories, and I'm, uh, we're now looking at the benefits we can get from playing with it. So these are all the different features inside the kernel that we can use to, to make our stuff easier to debug. Um, the first one is actually very very simple, deceptively so. Um, it's called all CPU backtrace, and all that is, when you get right down to it, is an IPI that is handled from the FIC handler and gets all processes in the system to call show regs. That's all it does. Um, but what you can view this as is this is a piece of code that you can call whenever you have discovered something isn't right. You can write custom code for it. I mean, whenever I have to debug something difficult, first thing I want to do is to get the CPU to spot that it's gone wrong and tell me where it is. Because if you can stop just after the point of failure, you've got a much better chance of finding out what the failure was. Um, there were also triggers built into the kernel to detect when something is wrong as quickly as possible. Uh, the most obvious one, the one many, ones, many, ones, many people here will have seen before, is debug spin lock. When you turn on debug spin lock, um, when you cannot acquire a spin lock, um, it will try to generate you a backtrace if you're running on an ARM. If you're running on a PC, it won't just give you the backtrace of the CPU that failed, it will give you the backtrace of all the processes in the system. And that can be very useful. Um, the, the example I can offer is if you have a interrupt handler, for example, uh, that has got stuck consuming no bytes in a loop, it will continue to be stuck in a loop consuming no bytes. Uh, so if you have any kind of bug that allows the counter to go to zero that you're you know, adding each time around the loop, um, then you can get stuck like that. And then if that interrupt handler owns a spin lock and somewhere else in the system you take the spin lock, um, you, will, you will lock up. But when you get the backtrace, you will only see what spin lock you're trying to acquire. 
you won't see the code that's live locked. So the difference you can get with all CPU backtrace is in those relatively unusual circumstances, but they are real, they do happen, uh, you get a deeper view of the system. Um, it would be really cool if things like the NMI button on a server is, is hooked up to this. In the least case, it gives you some idea of what's going on inside. Um, you could certainly, on an ARM sock with an external VIC pin, uh, hook up a switch to, to run exactly this if you want to. Um, SysRecL is an interesting case. You can use that to call this code, which of course I use for testing all the time. Um, but the SysRec handler is part of the, interrupt hand uh, the serial handling system, um, and to do it you have to have IRQs working. <laughs> So unfortunately, Sysrec L, how lovely it would be to have a key combo on your UART to get it to tell you exactly where it is, doesn't really work because it requires IQs. Um, I, did, I did mean to do some tests with Affinity to see if you could put the IRQ handler on to call three, for example, where there's not much going on in interrupts uh, and keep Sysrec L working when other things are broken. But it's, um, no, the, the main thing is to use things like debug spin lock and other hooks already in the kernel so that when you found something wrong, you can get a better view of the system. Um, this one I have to say, I'm, I'm going to skip this slide to keep the, the time down. Um, so we move on to performance monitoring. Th just to say the last slide was me rambling about how you could better design watchdogs. Um, it wasn't the feature that I've been working on. Um, performance monitoring. Um, if you modify the PMU driver to use FIC, you can get a more accurate kernel profile. Um, and what I mean by that is at the moment, if you, if you start doing performance monitoring on an ARM, um, it's a statistical mechanism. So the, the performance unit has counters in it, it counts up events, and whenever that counter overflows, it will generate an interrupt. So the simplest one, the one that's easy to understand, is cycle counting. If you have a cycle counter that counts simply the number of times the ARM has cycled, um, and you hit a counter to overflow it, then it's basically a very fast generated interrupt and from that interrupt handler you can look at the program count you've interrupted and that's your profile. It's how all classic sampling profilers work. Um, what makes PMUs much more interesting is that in addition to counting cycles they can count other interesting events. Um, cache misses is the other one that's really easy to intuitively understand. If you're doing performance work, cache misses really start to kill you. So if you can profile the parts of the code where you miss the caches a lot, uh, you can start thinking about how to how to fix that. Um, but because it's based on IRQ, there are certain wo workloads that you can apply, and I will show you one later, um, where the CPU is dominated apparently in the profile by spin unlock IRQ restore, some similar function. Um, what that means is we've spent a lot of time doing stuff with interrupts locked, not necessarily in the same point. You might you might be locking and unlocking frequently, but there's a section of code, the critical section, that when the counter overflows, we don't find that it's overflowed until we reach the end. So when we hit spin lock IRQ restore, we suddenly take the we've been putting off taking, um, and then spin lock unlock IRQ restore appears to be hot in the profiler. Um, I haven't checked what happens, I mean the same thing happens for interrupt handlers. If, if you were consuming lots of CPU in the interrupt handler, that would be invisible to you. And that's bad, because if you're consuming a lot of CPU and interrupt handler, you should design your system better. Um, so, yeah, it, it is, it is a, a lack in the performance monitoring based on IRQs. Um, as a side note, it doesn't offer any benefit whatsoever to profiling in user space, because the definition of user space is that interrupts are unmasked. So if you're doing user space work, turning the performance monitor over to FIC doesn't really make any, any beneficial difference. It doesn't do any harm, but it doesn't do anything useful. It is, it is for kernel and system profiling that we, we find this, this p potential opportunity. Um, so everybody happy with that one? Because um, the next one is, is actually built on it. Um, you can do hard lockup detector. Is anybody familiar with the hard lockup detector on a PC? Um, it's really cool. Basically, when you get stuck somewhere, within 20, 30 seconds, it will tell you where you're stuck. Um, it's essentially a, a watchdog that is portable. It's a fairly portable watchdog, basically. Um, it's actually two watchdogs. It consists of the soft lockup detector, which hopefully people here are familiar with, because that sits on IRQs. The soft lockup detector is, is nothing really more than a periodic HR timer. Uh, 
that checks that the scheduler is scheduling tasks properly. Um, and the hard lockup detector is a periodic NMI that checks that the soft lockup detector is doing its job properly, um, which is why I have to reduce them both. Um, so, so basically, what that means is if you deadlock in spin lock IRQ safe, um, then the periodic NMI will come in. It will observe that you have prevented the soft lockup detector from getting any CPU time because the HR timers can't go off because interrupts are locked. Uh, and at that point, it will show you a backtrace <coughs> of the core that's stuck. If you have multiple calls that are stuck, you get the backtrace all of them. In many ways, this is much more powerful than the um, debug spin lock or, or the all CPU backtrace that I mentioned before. But <coughs> the latency is much longer. It takes 15, 20, 30 seconds to find out what's gone wrong. Um, and if you have transient periods where you, if you've got a spin lock that you can't get for three seconds, debug spin lock will find it. And having all CPU backtrace will give you a better view of what happened at that point. This one, however, is a really nice backstop because almost all forms of live lock that don't involve completely trashing the memory subsystem um, will be found. <coughs> um, and then finally, this is the fourth final feature that we're going to talk about that we can we can start to play with, which is KGDB and KDB. These are the, the debuggers built into the kernel. Uh, just to differentiate for a slight, KGDB is an implementation of the GDB server protocol that allows you to take a second computer and use that over a serial port um, to, to debug a running kernel. Um, KDB is actually sitting on the same infrastructure as KGDB, but instead of speaking the GDB server protocol, it speaks something human readable. So you can just sit there on a you know, UART minicom session and type commands into it. Um, so you don't have as much access to symbolic information. It's a machine level debugger. Uh, the only symbolics you can see are those that are used by the kernel dynamic linker. Uh, so proc symbols you can play with, but other symbols you can't. You can't look at you know, static data and things like that. Um, and on Linux x86, I believe, from the code that I've read, uh, that you could press that NMI button that I mentioned on the front of a server and instead of dumping all the stack traces, you can hop into KDB and then dynamically poke around in the system. Uh, and we can do better than that on ARM because we have got socks. And on our socks, we have got a GIC. And on a GIC, we have got 1,000 interrupt lines. So we don't have to worry about interrupt sharing. So uh, this is a straw man architecture. This is not actually a very good idea, but it's a, it's a lovely concept. Um, what you could do is you could point your UART handler at the FIC. Uh, and from the FIC handler, you could spot that, that happened and jump into K KDB. What that would mean is I could sit there, I could press a button on my serial port, and the CPU would come to a halt and give me the KDB prompt. And the way that would work is KDB works by polling uh, characters from the serial port. So it actually goes in with the CPU and reads directly out of the FIFO, and it uses the CPU to write directly to the FIFO. It doesn't use interrupts. Um, so what would happen? is we would trigger KDB, it would then try and pull the um, serial port, it would pull the character you just typed out of the serial port and it would actually be the first character of its interactive session. So you could say BT, press return and it would show you the backtrace just like that. Um, and of course because it's pulled the character out of the FIFO, when you press go and press return, the system would restart because the interrupt had gone away because I just drew it out of the FIFO. Um, that's not actually a very good idea. And I'm going to do a quick aside um, here to describe why it's not a good idea. Um, so a quick hat tip, first of all. You know, all the work that I've been doing, and I've just been describing, uh, has been inspired by a, a, a relatively unknown feature in Android uh, called the FIC debugger. Uh, I have a Nexus 4 here. Uh, it has a FIC the, the FIC debugger built into it. It's multiplexed over the headphone jack. So if you get a special piece of hardware, and you plug it into the headphone jack, uh, and it has a, I think it's a resistor, is it? Across? It's straight up line. <laughs> the, the, oh, it's a voltage it's, divider, isn't it? So that you can the, the documentation online is confused. So I, I found that a straight 3.3 volt is what you need. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the classic design is you put a voltage divider circuit in, so you put a particular voltage on one of the pins on the headphone jack, and that causes the, the socket to switch from being a headset to being a UART. <laughs> And the really cool thing about that <laughs> is that you haven't wasted your USB socket doing it. 
and that means that you can still do all your USB on the go stuff while you're doing your debug through the headphone jack. Um, but it's a headphone jack, it's busy making amplified sound and I'm trying to plug things in and out of it. Now that's a noisy environment, right? Um, the actual act of physically hot plugging and unplugging a connector can have all sorts of crazy transients going on. Um, if you've got a character generated as you plug in the headset that causes the whole system to scream to a halt and wait for commands on KDB, your user is going to be really unhappy because he just you know, plugged in a headset and his phone has died and he doesn't know why because he didn't know that he had to put a certain voltage across the jack and then look at the back trace to find out that it stopped because he sent it a character. <laughs> um, so that means that although it would be very beautiful and elegant to just have it all set up for the thick and it's, it's all magical and you press a character and it stops, it's not actually a good idea. Um, so there are multiple solutions to this. The, the thick debugger on this phone doesn't use the same technique that, that I've been using. Um, the thick debugger here doesn't actually stop the system. Uh, it has commands you can run, but it doesn't bring the system to a halt to execute them. Um, but we wanted to keep with the ethos of KGDB, KDB, and that is a, a halt, stop the world, stop the world debugger. Um, so we have this special console driver called TTY NMI, and this isn't my idea, this was Anton's, um, that wraps around the UART. Um, and it can then spot for a collection of characters, a sequence of characters to trigger, and the length of trigger sequence affects the robustness, but it, it's very hard to accidentally do anything other than a serial break, usually. Um, the standard pattern it waits for is this rather obscure dollars three hash three three. Does anybody recognise that? No, blimey, no torso guys. <laughs> yes, right, yes. This is the um, command in the GDB server protocol. I think it's a wake up command just to say, are you there? It's a ping. Um, and what that means is that if you were to connect KGDB directly to this system and connect to the board, the first thing KGDB server would do is send that sequence, which means it would automatically stop. KG, KDB works out the box. Everybody's very, very happy. And it's, you can type that as a human. It's not that hard to type. I mean, it might be nicer to type stop or break or something else, but you can type it. Um, it's also quite unusual. I, I have never written that as a shell script, <laughs> um, which means I'm not going to type it accidentally and bring my system to a halt. Um, there's one other really nice thing about the uh, TTY and my <coughs> driver, which is that it also provides TTY services. Um, you know, the board down here has only got one serial port. I usually like to have my root console sitting on a serial port. Um, I don't want to have to give it over to KDB all the time and never be able to type commands in through my one serial port. So the other thing it does is it actually wraps around those polled interrupt functions that I mentioned um, and uses that to provide console services. Another lurching direction now, you're ready? Um, this is now practicalities, this is whether you can use this. So, so if anybody's here to find out if they can use these techniques right now when they go home, this is where you find that out. Um, this is the picture from earlier. This is what an ARM V7 looks like if you've not got trust zone. So you've got this lovely big ARM core with two sources of interrupt. This is what it looks like when you bring in the trust zone. So what's happening at the bottom is the security hardware has split the core into the normal world and the trust zone OS. It has dedicated the I flag, I field, so normal interrupts to normal world, thick interrupts to trust zone. And because this is all security hardware, you can't break out of the normal world to go and find your thick. It's designed to stop you doing that. Um, so this, the straight answer on an v 7 platform is that if you have a trust zone monitor present, uh, you cannot use this stuff at the moment. Um, there is an idea that could be used to work around this, but it's not yet been implemented. Um, and there are currently no plans to, to put time into this. Um, the secure monitor could, in principle, uh, be asked to field an interrupt on your behalf, so that when the interrupt comes in, it masks it, changes the register state on the normal world, which it's allowed to do. The normal world will then execute its NMI <coughs> handler, as a result of the context switch that was forced on it. Um, that will clear the source of interrupt. It will then track back into the secure world to re-enable the interrupt, and then we jump back into normal world and carry on as usual. Switching worlds is a relatively expensive operation. 
Um, I could hand wave about why it is it's something to do with the tags and the caches, but I don't know more than that. Uh, but I am told it's an expensive operation. Um, and we've done it four times. Now that's fine if you're typing on a serial port, that's not much to worry about. Uh, if you are using the performance monitoring unit to capture every 900 cycles, uh, not so good. Um, so it would bring with it a, a lot of limitations. So that the basic message on a, on a V7 system to exploit the FIC, um, it, it's best if you can run Linux in secure mode. Um, that means that secure bootloaders hate you. Um, and certain pieces of hardware also hate you because um, they have a mass program ROM that forces you into non-secure mode before it lets you out at all. Um, and that's all very lovely, but it means you can't use FIC. Um, there are some, some recommendations. The um, Greg Bellows did a whole pile of work on QMU. Um, so if you want to kick the tires and get an idea of the concepts, uh, you can do that on very recent versions of QMU. Uh, of course, on QMU, you no. uh, on QMU, you can also stop and look at registers without having to use the brick. It's, it's, sorry, it doesn't actually add that much uh, utility, um, but it does allow you to kick the tires and play with things. Um, there are parts out there you can work on. As it happens, well, ST's parts are actually very good at it. So ST's boards are very hard to acquire because they, they hit particular market segments. But if you have one of the ST media boards, um, you can do it there. Uh, the Freescale wand board is the best development platform for FIC that I'm aware of in the community boards space, as is the right one. Anything based on a Freescale IMX6 uh, is a really good board to play with. Um, and the actual fact that the straight answer is, if you can use the board <coughs> to develop Opti, you can also use the board to play with this stuff, but not simultaneously. So anybody who's developing Opti and has a piece of hardware on which they can, they can use Opti is, is absolutely capable of, of playing with this stuff. If you're in a silicon company doing board bring up and you haven't got your trust zone set up yet, you can probably use this. Um, once you've got a community board that has a trust zone built into it, it it's getting harder to start to exploit that board. So it, it's a shame. Um, there is some light at the end of the tunnel there. Uh, this was our trust zone system, ARMv7. And this is what happens, diagrammatically speaking, when you move to ARMv8. Uh, I've taken a lot of license with this because I've not checked how the PSR looks in an ARMv8 and all sorts of other things. Um, but if you have an ARMv8 and a GIC v3 or later, then what's effectively happened is the interrupt controller has moved closer to the CPU. Um, you can now talk to the priority filter very, very quickly. This is technically realized using the coprocessor interface. But what that means is instead of doing a long you know, register write to memory, got to flush out the, the, uh, all the data in flight and know that it's completed before you go and do anything else, uh, we can do a coprocessor instruction, a MISIS or an MS, MRS instruction um, to send it to the priority rate. I think you do have to flush the instruction buffer, but that's it. So, so we can in influence the priority filter much, much, much more quickly than we can on V7. Um, and what that means is you can change IRQ flags. And I, I've spent weeks doing this. Um, you can change IRQ flags so that instead of writing to the I and F I bit when it wants to mask interrupts, it goes to the priority filter and increases the priority above that of normal interrupts. And that's sufficient to stop interrupts happening. You then go in and nobble things like the context, uh, sorry, the system call handlers, because when you take interrupts, when you do system calls, I think the I bit gets set automatically by the hardware, so you can save the context. But at the end of the context, save logic, you can switch it around, you can go and write the priority filter, elevate the priority, unset the I bit, and that then allows you to take NMIs through most of the system. You know, I, I reckon it's only a couple of hundred instructions that are not instrumental <coughs> if you do that. Um, I've worked really, I really want to do a live demo based on that. Um, I have got to the point where I could demo it, um, but what I could show you was the kernel booting and surviving. I couldn't show you any other features. So I've got, I've got the IQ flags working, I can write the priority filter, I've got a working kernel as a result, but I can't get, I haven't yet got the GIC to actually uh, preempt another interrupt, because what should happen is, is when you set the priority right and a higher priority interrupt goes off, the, the interrupt comes in. I can't get that bit to work. I, I, I'm very, very sorry. I'm going to be doing the demo on V7 hardware. Um, but it is close. 
Um, it's close to working, and I, I do hope to do <coughs> basic robustness. You know, I, even at the level I've got, I can start trying to run advanced pieces of software, see if it breaks, see if I've missed anything, run workloads that are likely to break when, when these things happen. Um, so yeah, it's, it's getting there. Um, so I'll just give a quick status, and then we're on to the demo. How am I doing for time? Does anybody know? <coughs> okay, yes, so I, I will just about manage uh, in time, I think. Um, so there are no known bugs. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay, so the status is um, all CPU backtrace is partially upstream. Yeah, things like the default FIC handler are upstream. Um, some of the patches to change the default GIC uh, boot status so that you can group things are not yet upstream. The final bits of ARM architecture needed to, to finalize and connect all the plumbing together are not yet upstream. They're pretty mature, and the maintainers who have commented on it are giving um, implementation level review. They, they, they're not claiming that I've messed up the design completely. Um, I, I suspect I'm a little bit late for 320, but I have high hopes for 321 on that one. Um, performance monitoring is on the list at the moment as an RS, R, RFC. Um, that has got design level comments on it. Uh, uh, the summary is that when I implement the performance monitoring stuff, I have to go into the IRQ subsystem and add a new flag to allow you to say, I want this this interrupt to become an NMI. Um, and I think quite rightly, the barrier to go in and change the core interrupt system of an operating system is quite high. The threshold you have to meet to, to put code into the IRQ system is, is high. Um, and uh, I, the summary of the feedback is essentially that I've been far too ARM focused. <coughs> uh, I haven't thought enough about the other architectures he used Slightly less, you know, civil phrase, but uh, yeah, no, that's the basic feedback is that I, I've been too focused on ARM. I haven't concentrated. I haven't, for example, checked that I could implement the x86 NMI system using the same API and the same internal implementation. And I think that's the test I'm going to have to meet. So there is more work for me to do there. Um, and the other features all rely on that. So while the performance monitoring is getting design level review comments that I have to address. I'm not planning to release the bottom sections because it's just noise, it will annoy people, it, it's not actually uh, helping. It is available in Git, so if, if you want to play with it, I have merged together all my work into one single tree, it's based on 319 RC4 at the moment I think. Um, so if you want to play with it, you can have one kernel where you can do all this stuff at once. Um, but yes, uh, uh, until I, I can get the the design level stuff right, I don't see the point in trying to pitch the, the work further there. Um, how do I use it? Most of it just works. If the system boots and detects it has got the capacity to use FIC, it will deploy it automatically. If you've got spin lock debugging turned on and suitable hardware and my patches, it will just work better. You don't configure it. If you turn on the PMU and it's supportable, it will give you better results. Transparently, no configuration, it will just do it. Um, Lockup detector, <coughs> nearly. Um, at the moment, the lockup detector is initialized, and then later, the performance monitoring unit that it depends upon is initialized. So the, the NMI watchdog doesn't actually start up, but if you poke the sys registers after boot, you can get it running. That's not the case for KDB. KDB needs configuring anyway. Um, so it has couple of serial ports, serial drivers already ported over. That's the kernel configuration that you need to put in, and you have to change the kernel command line. So you say, I want my console to be the wrapper, I want my uh, KGB console to be the underlying console. So I have rushed through that, but otherwise I'm not going to fit the demo in. Um, so this is a booted system. It's fully booted up. It's fully booted up, and um, I'm not able to enter characters. <laughs> That's not what I need. OK, so we're booting it up again. Um, hopefully, it will let me characters enter characters when it comes in. I had that soak, running a soak test this morning. There's something in the electricity down here that's causing it to be unreliable. Um, Okay, yes. So I can log in. This is a Debian system as it happens, um, uh, a Jesse based one. 
Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is um, just run a quick command to generate a sysrec. Why is it doing that? Sysrec. Try again. Um, so I can enter a sysrec, I can put it to proc sysrec trigger um, to show you it doing it, and that's going to generate synthetically the backtrace. Um, so you can see in the backtrace, if we dig it out, that, yeah, this is the first entry point, this is the default FIC handler running. That's saving some state, it's jumping into the C code from here, called handle FIC as NMI. Uh, this is what I mean, that we're trying to make the FIC into an NMI. And then from the point up, we've got the logic to dump the backtrace. Um, I was th I've then got a, a driver that I've specially written in here whose sole purpose in life is to cause the system to wedge and crash in usefully way, useful ways. So this <coughs> one, I'm going to ask it to lock up and wedge. Now what it's going to do in a wedge, in this particular thing, is it's going to do that live lock case I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, what's going on there? version of driver of that. Oh, yeah. Um, so it says it's about to wedge. Uh, you saw it say about to wedge, and then about half a second later, it's printing out the backtrace. This is what I mean. You, it spots it, it's come through, and it's picked it out. Um, and uh, let's see if we can find it. There we go. So PC is at infinite loop holding a spin lock. I think it's likely that they would not give you quite such a nice function name. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, um, if, if you know what spin lock you're waiting for because you've seen which thing you're looking at, you should then, I would hope, if you know the software well enough, pick out that thing as, that looks suspicious, I will go and investigate that. Um, so I'm just asking it to reboot again so we can move on to the next demo, uh, which is the Perth demo. I have to make a slight confession at this point. I'm going to actually have to hot unplug some CPUs from this. Um, this particular board has a system integration bug that um, makes it very difficult to use the PMU when um, you're in SMP modes. Uh, I have been, I've got some workarounds, but uh, they're not quite uh, at the level to do a public demo with. Um, okay, come on. So I'm going to have to unplug the CPUs. Um, but bear with me, because this is actually the best part of the demo. After oh, I tried to put no password in, but I couldn't work out how to convince Debian's password um, happiness detector uh, that, that I, w I wanted to have no password. Um, so I'm going to just do the hot unplug now. So I'm using the, the hot unplug mechanism uh, to take CPUs, take CPUs offline. Um, Take CPUs offline, CPU one, CPU one's shut down. Two and three. Um, and I'm also going to, um, this is the only bit of code that I've written sort of custom for this demo. And it allows me to turn fix support on and off uh, without having to recompile the kernel. I said it deploys automatically. Uh, the unfortunate thing from the demo point of view is if it deploys automatically, um, and I can't show you the before and after without having to boot different kernels. So that's the only hack I've put in for this demo that's special. I've, I've hacked the, the Git driver so that I can disable FIC. Um, and the use case I'm going to show you is one you probably recognize. I'm going to take uRandom, the, the um, non-blocking source of random numbers, and write it to dev null. Um, so what this is at the moment is it is running using the traditional system. It's using IRQs. So this is what you will see of the system uh, when you run as IRQ. And what you can see here right at the top is exactly what I have mentioned. You can't see what's going on. You can see 80% of the CPU as it settles, it might climb up as high as 90, consumed unlocking interrupts. You have no idea what 85% of the CPU is doing in this particular workload. I did look out on this workload, it was actually the second one I tried and it gave me exactly what I wanted to show. Um, the other thing you can see actually, which is quite interesting, IMAX Pol Putkar, which is what's being used to draw the screen, is consuming quite a lot of CPU. This is worth noticing. Because TCYNMI is wrapping around 
these polling functions it is not a high performance console it is perfectly adequate for a root console to play with for, for debugging and diagnostic purposes but it, you can't use it for heavy duty activities because it does bother your CPU a bit um, but that's it you've got no real idea what this system is doing um, so I'm going to allow fig to take place now and redo the performance monitoring and this should now show you what you can see when you have FIC enabled and it's a really great illustration because you can now see that half the CPU is being used for crypto operate well you can see half of it being used for the underlying SHA, SHA1 transform and that after you've spent all that time doing SHA1 you're then doing the entropy mix to try and work out what to do with that information you've generated. Um, it would be nice if there's a whole big stack of functions but nevertheless you can now map that read from you random that I told you I was doing to exactly what the kernel's doing and I, I think that's a really great feature of this work and it, it, it came out because the community insisted that I do it uh, that this was the feature you should enable first you don't do KGDB first because it's complicated you do this because you can take the x86 prior art and make it better uh, and that's like I say I think that's a tremendously exciting part of this work um, I'm going to launch the hard lockup detector at this point now I mentioned that it doesn't start of its own accord um, what that has meant is I was able to do that demo because hard lockup detector uses the same resources as perf which means I couldn't have shown you perf if it had started up which is why I didn't fix it um, so now I can disable the NMI watchdog just like that and when I re-enable it it will be able to start up because now the PMU driver is initted so the watchdog's in place um, and if I use another of these lockup drivers that I've got this one is going to live lock in the IRQ handler on its own, it's not going to spin deadlock inside a spin lock, it's just going to live lock. The reason I've got the just live lock is because if I did let the system deadlock, config spin lock is still there and it would start shouting way before the hard locker detector tells you anything. Um, so I've carefully crafted a use case here where the hard locker detector fires but nothing else does. Uh, there are many other ways to do it, you can lock in interrupts, you can, um, the other good one is when you've got interrupts that don't get cleared and so the interrupt handler re-enters continually. Um, the hard lock detector I've also said is slow so in my script I now have to ad lib to you for about 30 seconds while it works out what's going on um, there is a problem actually which Nico will smile when I mention which is it's very hard to find out how fast the clock on an <coughs> arm is uh, <laughs> I thought he was yes um, <laughs> the problem I have is that I'm counting the cycles I can't find out how fast the core is running so I can't work out what number to put into the PMU to cause it to interrupt every 10 seconds like it's supposed to. So I've had to put in a fairly conservative number. So on this 800 megahertz part, it takes about 30 seconds to do what should be 10 seconds. If I took a modern 2 gig part, did the same thing, it would be interrupting roughly every 10 seconds. Um, the headroom with the current figure I've got is I think we can get up to about 3.5 gigahertz before the lockup detector starts triggering spuriously because the count is happening too frequently. If the hard lockup detector comes too often, then the HR timer hasn't gone off before we've had a chance to check on it. But you've now got your back traces, they've come up on the screen. Uh, so that's the one that's got it. You can recognize again, you've hit this uh, lovely, where's it gone? Oh, yeah, we've got this uh, do live lock IRQ. That's where it's spinning around doing nothing useful. It's gone onwards. Um, so the last thing we do is a reboot. Um, and I shall just give you the very fast look at KDB and then I think I'll probably get kicked out of the room. So dollars three hash three three. It hadn't actually got as far as starting uh, system D at that point. Uh, it hasn't handed over to init. I'm just starting up and already in the boot it started to do it. If you copy and paste it um, and click the middle button you can just wait for your reaction time. You can see the zero message coming in. Try and stab it and try and get <laughs> it early as you can in the boot process. Um, I certainly haven't managed to break it wherever I've tried to stop it. You know, I, I, I've tried uh, automated means to try and break it. So I haven't done quite as many automated techniques as I should have done to, to really show this. But you can stop it absolutely anywhere. Uh, and I can re-go. Um, it will then continue booting on. Um, and at any point, I can type dollars three hash three three and it will stop. So I can, t I can make my username dollars three hash three three. Uh, and it stops. <laughs> um, that has an interesting characteristic, actually, because um, I deliberately didn't want these messages to get trapped early and not sent on. So uh, when I select go, you start to panic, you think, oh no, it's not working, why is it not working? 
and it's usually because the passwords come in and there's a little timeout <laughs> that makes it unresponsive to stop you typing in passwords too, too soon. So, so I guess dollar three hash through three should be password even. No. no. <laughs> uh, it is configured. There's a module parameter. So you can make it as unlikely as you want. You could SHA1 your own address and make that your um, hash. When, when, when somebody to. hits that, that will be a, an interesting uh, bug report. <laughs> if they. It the will, auto, yes. You do the generate me a random password, you know. Yeah, um, it's, yeah, yeah it's possible, I, yeah. I, um, we can make. I mean, we can make it I'm, longer. We can do other things, but um, I think it's extremely unlikely. But the person that hits that will be uh, confused. Yes, that's <laughs> true. Uh, like I said, the thing I care about is the noise. I don't want. I want a sequence that's unlikely to be generated by noise. Um, now, I think that was the end of the live demo. I did say that I wouldn't get around to the bonus extra, and I haven't. Uh, are there any questions at this stage? Can you tell us what the bonus extra was? <laughs> oh, oh, all right then. If you want to see the bonus extra, that's excellent. Yeah. Um, <coughs> This is another little hat tip to the fit debugger that I, I've taken my inspiration from. It's a completely different feature. It's unrelated to NMI, but it sits in a similar space. Um, I've put my debugger on a headphone jack. I've now flown on an airplane. I have taken some set of headphones that they gave me when I sat on the airplane and plugged it into my phone, which has now got access to all the crypto material, my passwords, everything else, because they can stop the debugger and go and find out what happened. I don't want that. I don't like that. I believe Google would not want me to do that, and they didn't. Um, they deliberately restrict the set of commands you can run in a debugger, uh, and we've added the capability now to the kernel. This is upstream, this landed in 3.19. Um, we've added the capability in the kernel to restrict the set of commands you can run from a debugger. Now, the ideal for a debugger is you can break point, you can stop, you can uh, uh, read memory, you can do all sorts of things. But to be honest, you know, I, I also want to read dmessage because dmessage is not going anywhere obvious on this phone. Um, even if it was coming out of the serial jack right now and it crashes, I can't see it. So if I come in after the fact to plug it in, I want to type dmessage. So even that command is valuable. Um, but well, basically what we can do is we can limit it to passive inspection of state. So even breakpointing we have to disable. We owe that to Alan Cox who told us that yeah, you could just put breakpoints in the crypto logic and find out which value each bit is. Um, so yeah, well, even breakpoints have to be restricted. Um, I've implemented it much like Sysrec. So if you look at Magic Sysrec, it has a bit mask of features that you can enable and disable. So that if you're running a, some sort of kiosk and you would like people to examine things but not be able to halt, kill, list all tasks, whatever else you might want to stop, you can do that. So we have a bit mask of capabilities that the debugger can offer. The default is, is as it's always been, it's wide open. If you want to restrict it, it's an option. If you want to put this in embedded hardware so that it does not compromise the system uh, and you read my code and you trust it, um, then we have that capability. So that's your bonus extra. If you want to put this into real consumer hardware, um, it allows you to tackle the security implementation of having a debugger that is always there to help you. Are there any other questions? <coughs> wow, you guys are way quieter than my test audience. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>